Welcome to Docs on Call, brought to you by Methodist Medical Center, with your host, Gina Morse. Good evening, and welcome to Docs on Call. Tonight's topic, the ins and outs of joint replacement. As the baby boomer generation reaches retirement age and more Americans fight obesity, the number of joint replacement surgeries is on the rise. Surgery is generally the last line of defense reserved for when other treatments like physical therapy and medications have failed to produce desired results. That being said, joint replacement surgery is a highly effective means of eliminating pain as well as correcting deformities and restoring mobility. Tonight, Methodist Medical Center presents a special docs on call to help you learn more about hip, knee, and shoulder replacement. When should you consider it? What are the benefits and what should you expect from the surgery? Just dial 698-3742 to ask a question. That's 698-3742. And let's meet our experts. They are Drs. Michael Gibbons and Thomas Mulvey from Midwest Orthopedics. Welcome to you both. Sitting closest to me is Dr. Gibbons. He's board certified orthopedic surgeon who graduated from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, completed his residency at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, and a fellowship in sports medicine and arthroscopic surgery at Cincinnati Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center. Interesting fact, Dr. Gibbons was a four-year starter for Brown University's football team, so he says he understands a little bit about an athlete's desire to get back in the game. And to his left is Dr. Thomas Mulvey. Dr. Mulvey specializes in hip and knee joint replacement surgery. He applies his extensive training to replace the damaged parts of a joint with a prosthesis designed to function just like a normal joint. The board certified orthopedic surgeon graduated from Creighton University School of Medicine in Omaha, completed his residency at Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago, and fellowship at Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Again, thanks to you both for being here tonight. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank we already you. have lots of interest in that subject. It should be no surprise because uh, many of us uh, <laughs> have lots of aches and pains and some more severe than others. So let's get right to a call from John. John, thanks for watching Docs on Call. What is your question this evening? Hi, I had a joint replaced uh, last July. I had the ball of my foot replaced with a titanium joint. And um, my doctor says it's somewhat normal that I still can't bend my foot, then my toe. I'm in more pain than I was in before I had surgery. I keep going back for follow-up appointments and we don't do anything. We keep taking x-rays and I'm wondering, is it maybe time to seek another uh, opinion? Thanks for that question, doctors. Can we take that think? one? Uh, neither one of us are uh, um, experts in toe joint replacements. Uh, we do have a doctor in our group that does replace uh, toe joints and uh, I would agree that if you're having trouble with it, um, that's usually a pretty successful surgery. Uh, I think um, that stiffness is uh, certainly a complication or a potential risk of that type of surgery. Um, and if it's still painful, uh, I know there are other things you can do. You can replace it again. You can actually fuse the joint. Obviously, that'll make it stiff, but uh, should get rid of the pain. Uh, but that's something, if you're not satisfied and you're continuing to have problems, I think it's certainly worthwhile to get another opinion. I don't think uh, any of us that do surgical procedures would be upset if another patient or if a patient went to see another physician if he was unhappy. I think that's a reasonable thing. Well, you want your patients to be pain-free if possible, and if they're in continued pain and someone else can maybe offer a, another um, thought, uh, a, another kind of therapy. Ultimately, the goal is to make the patients happy, you're right. That's right. All right. And, and guys, what are you seeing as a common thread in your office in terms of people that are visiting you, more commonly knee pain, uh, severe knee pain, hips, what is most common? Go ahead, Tom. Well, I think we're just seeing an increased number of people coming in complaining of, of many joints aching and bothering them. The knees are probably a very common uh, joint that uh, we notice. Uh, it's more common than hips in general. Uh, we're seeing uh, people that are, are more active, uh, we're seeing people that, uh, the baby boomers now, the people that have been active and are starting to get to an age, we're starting to see a lot of uh, arthritic deterioration. So we're, we're seeing a lot of those patients coming in with uh, increased, uh, you know, complaints of pain, stiffness, swelling, uh, symptoms that are starting to affect their quality of life. Our next caller, Diane, in fact, is one of those folks who's experiencing a lot of knee pain. So Diane, thanks for watching. What is your question for our experts this evening? Well, I'm 44 years old, and I was told I need a knee replacement. I am bone-on-bone in bone a 45-degree angle, and I'm a nurse. I'm on my feet all the time. 
So I want to know what's too young to have a knee replacement because I know what's all involved with a knee replacement and it doesn't thrill me. <laughs> well, yeah. Great question. What yeah, I was going to say it's, um, I mean, there's no absolute um, age requirement. Uh, we tell the patients that it's nice to wait as long as possible. And the problem uh, with these joint replacements, they're artificial parts. They're metal and plastic and they can wear out uh, and they can come loose. Um, so it's nice to do all the other treatments. You mentioned that in your introduction. Uh, there's medications, injections, physical therapy, activity modification, weight loss. Um, all those things can help uh, decrease symptoms uh, for arthritic knees. Um, you get to a point sometimes when you've tried all these things, you've done everything you can possibly do, and it's uh, just you can't tolerate it. When you can't tolerate the pain anymore and you've tried all these other things, uh, you may need a knee replacement at 45 years old or 44 years old. So. Um, and I think Tom and I both done joint replacements in young patients like that, and sometimes there's just no alternative if the uh, uh, patient can't tolerate the pain anymore. All right. Brandon is our next caller. We want to hear from here, from him. Brandon, thanks for watching. What's on your mind this evening? Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, I tore my meniscus playing basketball. I'm uh, 28 years old, and at the present time, I can't afford the surgery to have uh, the arth arthroscopic surgery. So I was wondering if if I put it off for a while and have it later on, am, am I running a, a, a greater risk of having scar tissue or anything of that nature, or what do you think? Thanks, Brandon, for the question, doctors. Well, m meniscus tears are a little different than those that are suffering from arthritis. The meniscus is a uh, cushion type of a cartilage that we have in our knee. There's one on the uh, inside and outside and uh, that normally serves as a cushioning or a padding between your uh, articular surfaces. And it's a pretty common uh, injury to sustain, especially in our, our younger uh, patient population. Um, unlike joint replacement, which when we're discussing about replacing parts, meniscus surgery is a little different. It's uh, usually done arthroscopically, and that's a procedure where if, uh, if the meniscus that is torn sometimes can be repaired or, or fixed, or it can be um, sometimes just excised if, if it's a smaller fragment. Uh, that, that's a more straightforward outpatient type operation that can usually be done in a, with, a, with a quicker recovery. So if, if, it's, if it is bothering you, then uh, it would be something that would be usually worthwhile to take care of. And, and doctors and, and your team can help investigate uh, in, in terms of affordability and advocate for your patients, right? Because that's yeah. one of the concerns that Brandon brought up, and I'm sure he's not alone out there. Yeah, no, he's not alone. There, there are different programs out there to get assistance, and you know there are some meniscus tears that uh, can wait, and it's not harmful. There's some that uh, should be fixed sooner rather than later. So it's a difficult thing to to know just from a phone call whether uh, you know what uh, scenario he's under, but uh, certainly it, it should be looked at. All right, Rosetta, thanks for your patience. And uh, calling in tonight, what is on your mind? Okay, I had right knee replacement surgery done in December of 05. And I went to a, another orthopedic doctor in, in December, and he told me that my right knee replacement is coming loose. And how long can I put off the surgery? Rosetta, thanks for your question. Well, All right, Tom, why don't you take that one? It, it's been, that was in 2005, so there's... Um, Certainly we want joint replacements that we put in to last longer than that, but there are sometimes some different reasons why they what can. What is the average length that it will last on a knee Well, if you look at the, at the data, you know, most, most knee replacements should, you know, have a, a documented about 90% survivorship at about 15 years. So most of them are, even at that point, are still functioning pretty well. Wow. Then and they she's can start only at seven years. Right. So there's, there's different reasons why knee replacements or like any kind of artificial part can prematurely wear out or fail or come loose. There's a variety of different reasons that can happen. And so I think one of the, the most important uh, things to do when evaluating the patient is to uh, take a good look at that, at the, the patient, the history, the x-rays, and really figure out why it's come loose because that can often be an important role in the, you know, the etiology or the cause of that and what may be the next best thing to, to do to fix it. Is it possible to go in there and look at it and make an adjustment versus taking out that, that knee again and replacing it with a new one? It, I think well, whenever you're evaluating somebody that already has a, an artificial joint, it's, it's really important before you actually perform the operation to have a, a pretty good idea about what you're planning on doing. 
you know, there's, you know, if you're looking at just uh, to go in to explore things, uh, sometimes that hasn't has historically had the best track record. So what we want to do with our preoperative workup with x-rays and different testing methods is to, to really get an understanding about what is going on before we get in there so that when we do, we can then address whatever we need to, to fix. All right. And sometimes it may just be a, a changing a, a certain part or fixing something, and you may not have to, to, to redo a screw, the, so whole, to speak. the whole operation. <laughs> not quite that simple, but... <laughs> yeah, there's some parts that, uh, that, that wear out that you can replace and without taking out the whole uh, implants. So. That's good to know. Yeah. So and, and we should tell our viewers at home, the phones are ringing off the hook here, so if we don't get to your <laughs> call right away, please be patient. We will try to answer your questions. Our doctors will as best they can. Marilyn is on the line now. Thanks for your patience. Marilyn, what's your question? Uh, several years ago, I went to a clinic and, uh, about my rotor cuff, and they told me I had no rotor cuff, that it had worn away, and I was able to have good, good uh, radiance on my heart, or in my arm. And they said that the best thing they could do was nothing and don't let anybody operate on my shoulder. But just recently, it has been giving me quite a fit. And I, I can hardly raise it. I can still fling it up and around, but to raise it with something in my hand, it's almost impossible and it hurts even get my clothes on. Oh gosh, Marilyn, that sounds very painful. I didn't know that a rotator cuff could virtually wear away. Is that possible? Yeah, that's certainly possible. Uh, a rotator cuff is a group of tendons, uh, muscles and tendons around the shoulder to help move the shoulder. And they can wear out, they can tear. Uh, sometimes they're small tears, uh, sometimes they're uh, medium, large tears, and sometimes they're massive tears. Uh, the massive tears, which uh, may be the case here, are uh, sometimes not fixable. Uh, most of the times we go in there with rotator cuff uh, problems or tears, uh, do arthroscopic surgery and try and repair the tissue. Uh, the tendon pulls off the bone, so we actually reattach it back to the bone. If they're too big and it's, uh, and it's not fixable and the patients are still having uh, pain, um, there are some joint replacement procedures that can be done. Uh, usually these massive rotator cuff tears are associated with some arthritis. Uh, in the old days we had trouble fixing the, uh, uh, or, or doing joint replacement without the rotator cuff, but there's some new advancements with a uh, type of replacement that we call a reverse total shoulder replacement, um, where the implant actually is designed in such a way uh, that you can function at a very high level without your rotator cuff. So that's something to consider and ask your doctor, um, is a reverse total shoulder replacement something um, for me? Well, and it sounds like she's tried to, to cope with it for a while without making that replacement, and now it's giving her so much yeah. pain. I mean, there are, again, there are the other options that we talked about, the medications, injections, and so forth, and if those aren't working, certainly should talk to somebody about uh, possibly a shoulder replacement. Very good. Karen is on the line now. Thanks for calling, Karen. What's your question? Yes. I was wanting to know when you get needles, shots put in the side of your knees, how long that lasts it, to get the stiffness out of your knees. Okay, Karen, that's a another good question. She's yeah. talking about injections. Now, right. would that be something like a, a cortisone shot? Right. Um, that's a very common uh, practice that we do a, at the office, and uh, cortisone is a as a, often uh, an excellent choice for a lot of patients that, that are suffering from knee arthritis that maybe aren't ready for, for a surgical procedure yet. Uh, an injection is basically where we put some Novocaine combined with cortisone into the arthritic inflamed joint and uh, it's a fairly straightforward procedure to do and um, it can often provide you know uh, several months of relief for some and uh, it can it can be often a, a very helpful adjunct to someone's therapy. Now some people may not get as much relief mm -hmm. in that you know they'll have a, a shorter duration of, of symptomatic relief is and there it can a particular vary. reason for that? Well, sometimes, you know, some people have more earlier stages of arthritis, others that are more advanced, and, you know, so those patients that are more advanced sometimes may not have as much of a, a positive clinical response, but uh, it's often a, it's a pretty low-risk uh, treatment option, so. Is it an option that you should exercise often, or is there a point at which yeah. enough is enough? Overall, I mean, the standard of care is to try to, to limit the amount of times we have to inject 
these uh, these joints. So when if we give you a, a cortisone shot, we'd like to see it last as long as possible, several months or maybe even a year if that was a, a possible. And you know they can be repeated a few times a year if if needed. But cortisone does have some side effects that that uh, if we use it too frequently can uh, can occur. So certainly trying to you know minimized overuse w is in the patient's long-term best interest. All right, doctors, it's time for us to take a quick break. And when we return, our experts from Midwest Orthopedics are here taking more of your questions about joint replacement. This is Docs on Call. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your knees ache and make funny sounds when you walk up and down the <laughs> stairs. How about your hips or your shoulders? Does severe joint pain have you contemplating surgery? If so, we want to hear from you tonight. Our experts, Dr. Michael Gibbons and Dr. Thomas Mulvey from Midwest Orthopedics are taking your questions. Just call 698-3742. That's what a lot of you are already doing. So let's get to another question from Pam. Thanks for watching. What's on your mind? I had knee replacement in 2007. And within the last week, all of a sudden, my knee is locking up um, in a lot of pain. Um, like I can't even hardly lift it to like into the bathtub to take a shower or anything and I was wondering what they you know recommended. Pam thanks for your question. I was going to say a lot of times if there's um, a sudden onset of change in symptoms um, there's probably some type of a mechanical problem um, and there are some of the parts that can come loose uh, most commonly is the kneecap. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, obvious deformity or uh, prominences loose pieces floating in there um, if it doesn't resolve uh, within a reasonable period of time, that's probably something to be investigated and looked into. Yeah, that's, that's more than just a little bit of yeah. pain when your knee locks up like Especially that. Especially if you're having some other symptoms like swelling and, and catching and, you know, in, inability to kind of do your daily function, that could be a little bit more severe. Yeah. So probably something to look into sooner rather than later in that yeah. particular scenario. Thanks for the advice. Suzanne is on the line now. What's your question for our doctor, Suzanne? Sorry, I guess I jumped the gun a little bit yet. I'm not quite ready for Suzanne. But we are uh, taking lots of your questions this evening, and we are ready Wait, now. Sir. Suzanne, what's on your mind? I had this uh, synthesis one uh, for severe knee, and it lasts six months, and I was wondering uh, how long it does it take for this to, to really set in? Is it a good thing to do? Because the other one I have done too, but I've had the injections. They didn't work, and also my legs just keep swelling, and I was wondering, I've even done therapy, water therapy, and that didn't work either. So I was wondering, uh, is it just putting off an interval that I have to have a knee replacement soon? Suzanne, how old are you? I am 71. And how long have you been experiencing this kind of pain and trying to treat it through other methods? Uh, well, just the last year or two. And now I've got my foot deteriorating on the other on the other knee and leg. Mm. Well, I mean that's a that's a pretty common age that that we start to begin to consider joint replacement surgery. You talked uh, about uh, Synbisc, which is another type of uh, a therapy that we hadn't mentioned yet on the show, but it's um, it's another type of injection besides cortisone that you can actually uh, place into the joint. It's a very thick, viscous, syrupy-like fluid. And the thought is that if we can inject uh, a material to help provide some lubrication and cushioning, sometimes that can also provide some short-term relief for up to six months in uh, patients uh, suffering from arthritis. So that certainly is, is something, and if it did help, that could be repeated along the lines of the other treatments with the cortisone and bracing and, and topical measures, pain medicine. Those are all the things that we'll continue to work with too, but if, if your knee is certainly that painfully, you know, bothering you, then it's it's probably time to maybe consider, you know, you know joint replacement. Like she said, don't put off the inevitable, perhaps yep. it's what you need to do. Marianne, yes. are you there? Yes, I am. What's going on with you? Um, I have both hips have a tear in the labrum, and I'm wondering why is the orthoscopic hip surgery for this considered a low success rate? Good question. So hip labrum tears, and, and she's saying that from what she's been told, that orthoscopic surgery has a low success rate. Labral tears of the hip are usually associated uh, in a slightly younger patient population. 
Uh, we see a lot of labral tears and people with severe arthritis, but that's at the stages where the joints are already severely deteriorated. But in the young patient where there's more isolated labral tears, there's some different reasons why that can happen. Sometimes it can be post-traumatic. Uh, some people have an, a sim syndrome called impingement syndrome, which can cause the bones to become pinching and that tissue in the middle become torn. Um, hip arthroscopy is often sort of a last resort to treat that. Uh, but it is not the most commonly performed procedure. It uh, requires some uh, centers that usually perform them a little bit more frequently, and uh, it's a little bit of a more technically demanding procedure. And some of the results still are a little bit uh, less than uh, predictable as far as outcomes when it comes to that uh, operation, okay. compared to knee arthroscopy, which is much more commonly performed. And real quick, before we get to our next call, we're hearing from a lot of women tonight. Are more women coming into your office, more men, both? What do you I mean, think? I think statistically, um, degenerative joint disease is more common in women. Um, although we see, we see plenty of men too, but I think uh, as far as you know, statistically, uh, probably more common that we see the women than the men. All right, we'll talk about that a little bit more about the why that might be in a mm -hmm. moment. First, one of those women, Jody, is on the phone right now. What's your question, Jody? Hi, I was wondering, you had said that a knee replacement typically lasts about 10 to 15 years. Can you get two on the same knee? Yeah, I think, I think what was said is that uh, statistically it's not like they last 10 or 15 years. I think what uh, Dr. Mulvey said is uh, statistically at 15 years uh, that there's about a 90% chance that that replacement is still going to be working. Okay, not that they all wear out in 15 years. And yeah, there are a variety of reasons, like we talked about earlier, that these implants can wear out, they can come loose, they can fail for a variety of reasons, and then you can get them redone. Uh, so you can have two or sometimes even more if necessary uh, to get the pain relief that you need. And I think too, now technology has certainly improved over the past 40 to 50 years that knee replacements have continued to, to evolve. Our surgical techniques have improved, but, but really importantly, the, the devices so that the old Oh, I can't get my knee replaced because it's only going to last eight to ten years philosophy. That's, that's really not true anymore. So we do have much more durable, durable implant technology to help people, you know, have a much longer lasting result. I think that's a good point. The data that we're quoting is from the knees that were put in 15, 20 years ago. And so hopefully we're doing a better job, better techniques, better implants, uh, that these will even last longer and the numbers will be even better than that. Oh, let's hope. That would be good. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we've heard from a lot of women, but we have a gentleman on the line now. Tom, what's your question tonight? I have a question. Um, I assume you've heard a trigger finger before? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I was wondering, uh, is there an injection for trigger finger that will actually eliminate the problem? Well, trigger finger, it's, um, again, we're not hand experts, but we certainly have dealt with uh, trigger fingers, and that's a problem where um, there's a, a, t a piece of tissue called the tendon sheath that, uh, that the tendon itself runs through, and sometimes there's some swelling of the tendon, and it, uh, and it, it kind of creates a little bit of a, a block there. So when you, you bend your finger, it locks up, and then it just that little swelling in the tendon pops through that sheath and causes the problem. And uh, the goal of the injection would be to decrease the inflammation and the swelling in that particular area. And I think that's a good first line treatment as opposed to surgery, which involves uh, cutting the tendon sheath. And a lot of people do need the surgery uh, to, to help that, uh, but certainly there's no problem getting an injection. Again, there are some risks, and, and talk to your doctor about the risks and problems that might be involved with an injection. Um, but I think that's worth a try, and it's a common uh, procedure to do that prior to the injections. All right, very good. Gary's on the line now. Thanks for your patience, Gary. What's going on with you? Well, I just wanted to say that uh, for any of you who's contemplating having your knees replaced, I had both mine replaced a little over three years ago. I am absolutely uh, pain-free. Dr. Mulvey did it for me, and I just absolutely love them. I can walk five miles before I couldn't walk a block without being in pain for three or four hours. And I've rode a bike uh, 10 miles. I pick up my 70 pound uh, grandchild and carry her around up and down steps and I don't do anything he tells me not to do like uh, <laughs> run or play basketball or something but I'm very thrilled about how well they work and, and just the complete pain relief I have. Oh, that's well, great news Gary thanks, and a Gary. great endorsement for you. Well, yeah, and you. I think that's a common scenario where patients come back and say this is unbelievable my world has expanded I can do more now uh, why didn't I do it sooner? 
And we should mention too, I was talking to some friends earlier today who are aware of your work in, in particular and, and who said that, that you're a conservative orthopedic surgeon. In other words, you don't jump into surgery or really encourage it unless it is necessary. And, and I think that what we're, a common theme we're hearing from folks is maybe they're skittish about surgery because they've heard some horror stories, but when we hear from callers like Gary who finally said enough is enough mm -hmm. and the relief they feel that's good news. I'm sure that's what yeah. you want to hear from oh, patients. I think it's important too, Gina, to, to know that, you know, the things we do help a lot of people and it really can make a significant difference in quality of life. But there are some risks associated with any surgical procedure we do. So it's important too to discuss those as well with patients, you know, when we meet them. Absolutely. And real quick, we had someone ask about chemotherapy and surgery. How long do they have to be off of chemo before going through joint surgery? Is there any yeah, kind of rule? Well, I mean, chemotherapy is a very uh, uh, traumatic event, very toxic mm -hmm. to the to the system, and I would uh, certainly defer uh, any decision on joint replacement to the uh, oncologist and, and let them make sure that the laboratory uh, data is, is adequate and they're not at increased risk of infection and so forth and so on. All right. Doctors, thank you for your expertise this evening. Thanks to all of you at home for watching. We know there are many questions we would, did not have time to get to. <laughs> Methodist Medical Center will try to get answers for you online. Again, doctors, thank you. Thanks to you Thanks, at home. Gina. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another installment of Docs on Call. Until then, I'm Gina Morse. Have a great night. <laughs>